local food for local people coming up next. blended, shredded, and it's going to be served on ciabatta. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden to Table. I've got an exciting show for you today. If you've ever heard of this phenomena called outstanding in the field, well, you're going to experience it here today. We're in the middle of an organic vegetable farm, and we're going to eat a meal here with a lot of folks, about 180 in fact. In today's show, we're all about reconnecting the farmer with the chef and the consumer. You see, it's all about reconnecting ourselves to the land and the food that we eat. In today's show, we'll talk with Keith Bramwell about raising New Hampshire Reds at home. Wonderful breed. They're a very interesting breed and there's nothing fresher than eggs from your own backyard. And believe me, these girls lay a lot of eggs. I'll also show you a great way to preserve vegetables like broccoli that you've grown yourself. And later on, I'll talk with Buddy Valines about community gardens. They're a great way for people to come together, have some fun, and grow some of their own food. Okay, now while they're setting up for tonight's dinner, I want to take you to Oklahoma. I want you to meet Sam Bracken of the Cane Break Restaurant. He's going to talk about how important local food is to him and all of his customers. We're at the Cane Break Resort in eastern Oklahoma. There's something really special going on here today. This evening, they're having a 75-mile dinner. Now, what that means is all the food that's being prepared here came from farmers who farm in a 75-mile radius of this place. I'm really excited about it. I don't know what they're going to come up with in the kitchen, but we're going to find out. Come on. So how do you think it's gone, Sam? I think it went great. You really happy with it? Yeah, yeah. A fun new experience for us. We've done a lot of specialty dinners over the years, the four short years we've been open. But this one was especially fun to take all these great products from local 75 miles-ish around and, <laughs> and, and pair them up with some fun wines and have all these farmers and producers talk about them. Meeting new friends and eating fun new food and hearing about all the uh, local things from Oklahoma, it was a lot of fun. Today we're gonna cook a steamed pork dumpling with porter peach drizzle over mixed greens. It's a very easy recipe. Begin by poaching some peaches in apple juice. This will be the base of our peach and chili drizzle. We're using Tabasco chilies we grow here in the garden. You can adjust this recipe to your heat tolerance. We'll also begin cooking our pork. We're going to use a little bit of olive oil. We'll saute some diced red onion, some finely diced carrot, minced garlic, and just a touch of fresh ginger. We're going to get these things rolling. To the peaches, we're going to add a little bit of sugar pinch of salt all around, pinch of freshly cracked black pepper. So your onions and carrots have begun to caramelize a bit, you can add your fresh ground pork.
We want to cook our peaches down to very soft so we can puree this, end up with a very smooth garnish for this dish. Ground pork is, in this case, technically from the ham. You can grind this at home if you're fortunate enough to have a grinder or ask your butcher. But you want a nice, high quality product, 80, 20, 80% meat, 20% fat, so you have a lot of flavor. Get it nice and brown. We're gonna take our pork, drain a bit of the fat off. We're gonna let this cool to where we can handle it. Make our dumpling. Don't forget your peaches. Meanwhile, I'm gonna come back with a wonton wrapper. Uh, you can buy these at the store. Lots of shapes and sizes. This is just egg whites. You wanna do the entire wrapper, not just the edges. I'm gonna use about an ounce of this mixture. There's lots of shapes that you can do. But you wanna make sure that you have as little air inside as possible. They tend to explode. You'll start by giving it fold, same direction, a little squeeze, the egg wash will grab. You'll end up with this neat little purse. Now you want a bottom, and then whatever design you decide to have on top. For cooking those, I'm gonna use just a little bit of olive oil. Go ahead and use a Teflon coated pan you want your pan to just begin to smoke before you put your dumpling in. Swim your dumpling in on the bottom. We're gonna look for a nice brown on the bottom Then I'm gonna tip him over on either side, get a little extra color, a little caramelization with the wrapper. They tend to blister like a egg roll. We're all familiar with how those come out. Same kind of wrapper and then we'll steam it. Meanwhile, we will puree our peach and apple juice. You can see the color and the blisters that develop on the wonton skin. I'm gonna do that all around. I'm doing this over medium heat. You don't wanna let it get away from you. And you don't wanna smash it either, and lose your design. Now to this, I'm going to add some vegetable stock. And be very careful, you're adding water to oil. I'm gonna steam my dumpling, put a lid on it, just like that. I'm gonna come over here and get my plate ready. For this, I'm gonna add just a little bit of your favorite mixed greens. We have our peach and chili puree. This dumpling will take Mm, a minute or two to steam. Our dumplings done. We're gonna garnish with a little bit of our fresh peaches. Steamed pork dumplings with peach and chili glaze. chance to sit down with Keith Bramwell and discuss a breed of chicken that's known as a great egg producer. It's called the New Hampshire Red. There's a number of different birds that we can have for the backyard chicken flock depending on uh, what our purpose is, what our goals are, um, but a good general purpose bird that might be good for egg production and meat production. This New Hampshire bird here is probably a pretty good example of that. It's a breed that is an American bred bird, started up in the northeastern part of the U.S. Really is one of the unique and one of the breeds that wasn't really created from a cross of other breeds of more of the old Rhode Island Reds. The evolution and selection more towards this color pattern and type and, and for egg production. So it's kind of an offshoot of that old Rhode Island Red. Typically very good birds can lay, lay good eggs, could be used as a dual purpose bird for meat production. It's not necessarily known for that, but it is a little heavier set bird than what you would uh, find in some of the Mediterranean breeds like the 
leghorns and, and things like that. Can handle cold weather, can handle warm weather, a little bit better than some of the heavier breeds like um, the Orpingtons or Wyandots. And it's kind of an intermediate type of bird. But this is a very good general dual purpose bird that, that can do a, any homeowner owner well in the backyard type flock. So they might lay anywhere from 70 to 80 percent production which means um, if you get have 10 chickens, you can expect seven to eight eggs a day. Might be good for a lot of families. If you wanna share with the neighbors, you might wanna have a few more birds than that. You know, you really don't wanna do two birds or three birds or four birds. You know, if you're gonna go through the effort of, of constructing an appropriate pen situation, care for them like they should be cared for, you should really shoot for half a dozen, maybe 10 to 12 birds, making sure they have plenty of room. You don't wanna go anything under maybe five, six square feet per bird. The less stress a bird is put under, the better she's gonna produce, giving them a good diet. You know, we know a lot about nutrition of chickens. We know more about the nutrition nutrition of chickens than we do people, you know, giving them that diet formulated for chickens and then letting them forage and run a little bit and reducing stress, keeping them proper temperature, preventing them from getting too, getting wet, getting preventing them from getting too many drafts on them, keeping their pens and their floor space dry. All those things really contribute to good health in the birds and, and uh, that'll give us the best results as far as caring for our birds. I want to show you one of my favorite ways to eat fresh broccoli. This is a delicious chopped broccoli salad recipe. I call it broccoli slaw that is so easy to make. You know, I love to grow broccoli. We grow lots of broccoli here at the farm. I just went up to the garden and pulled up one of the plants. And you can see how it grows. It makes that beautiful uh, head of broccoli with all these little tiny florets. And each of these are little flower buds. And you want to pick it at about this stage before the little buds swell and open too much. And you know, every part of the broccoli plant is edible. So I'm chopping some stalk here. You can see the stalk is getting chopped finely. And you can also eat the leaves. I'll even throw some leaves in here just for fun and prove to you that they're edible. So I'm chopping up about four big heads of broccoli. And I'm shaving them from the stalk up to the little florets like this, you see? Let me go ahead and get this one. You can see a little closer here. Shaving the stalk back and moving my way up to the florets until I get so close with the knife I'm afraid to go any further. Same with this one. So then I just take my large knife and chop it up like this. What I like to do is make a big batch of this. Now it's perfect for keeping in the refrigerator. It'll keep for several, several days and it's also a great recipe to take to a function where you may be feeding a lot of people like a family reunion or an office party, something like that. All right, so that's four heads of broccoli and that makes about eight cups, eight cups of chopped broccoli. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a dozen of our green onions from the farm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That's 12 of them. I'm just gonna take the ends of them off here. These little green onions we grow year round. And it's great to go up there even in the fall and early spring and gather them. And you can see I'm moving right up the stalks here because I want a lot of that green as well. So that's about enough. What this ends up being is about a cup and a half of green onions. Just wanna make sure they're about the size of the broccoli. Just throw that in here like this. All right, now, next thing is to do the dressing, which is really a lot of fun. Now I'm going to start with a cup of mayonnaise. Yes, that's what I said, mayonnaise. I love mayonnaise. And I did use the light mayonnaise here, getting it all in the bowl like that. And then I'm going to take a fourth of a cup of walnut oil and a fourth a cup of white wine vinegar and half a lemon, the juice of half a lemon, I should say, without the seeds, preferably. We don't want those getting caught in one's teeth. There we go, it's all the seeds. Two tablespoons of lemon pepper and some garlic powder, half a teaspoon of garlic powder. And I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna mix it all together. You just wanna whisk this until it's smooth and the mayonnaise is all in solution here. 
the walnut oil adds such a nice depth to this. Okay, now I'm just gonna take the broccoli and the onion, pour it in here, and just begin to mix it all together. You just wanna bathe all of that broccoli and onion in the dressing. And that's really all you have to do to it. Now I'm gonna finish it off with a half a cup of toasted English walnuts, which adds a little more crunch to this, as if it needs it. And then, of course, I'll add plenty of cracked black pepper. It's really delicious, and as you can see, easy to make. I hope you'll give it a try. You know, I love to preserve food, particularly the food that we grow here at the farm. And in the spring, we can get lots of vegetables coming in out of the garden. And one of my favorite things to do is to freeze it. And to do that, I always like to blanch. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm taking some broccoli, because we've got a really great bumper crop of broccoli this year. And what I'm doing is I'm just splitting the broccoli florets into the size that I typically like to cook with. And I'm just taking these last three stalks like this and splitting them. They also pack in the freezer bags better. All right, so there we go. One more. We grow several varieties of broccoli here. Um, it's one of the easiest early spring vegetables to grow. It's very rewarding and very good for you. Now, to blanch, what I've done is I've cut these in the size that I like. I've got boiling water going on over here, and what I'm going to do is just drop these florets into the water for only one minute. Whoops, there goes one. That's what happens. Now, you say, why blanch? Well, blanching preserves the color and the flavor and the texture of vegetables if you're going to freeze them. And um, it also slows down or eliminates the, the action of enzymes that would break down the flavor of the, of the food or the color of the food. And so by just um, dropping this in here, this hot water for one minute, then I'll pull it out and I'm gonna throw it in some ice water to stop the cooking process. Okay, that's about enough. All right, so I'm gonna take this bowl of iced water, and place it right here on the stove. I'm going to pull up the broccoli like that, let it drain for just a second, see, let all the water pour off, and then I'm going to drop it in here, stop the cooking, all right? Look at that beautiful color, and that's what we want to preserve. And you can tell just by pushing on, it's still crunchy and crisp, it's not going to be mushy, all right? There's that. Bring it over here. and it's already cooling off, so I'm stopping the cooking process. You're gonna want the broccoli to stay in the water until it's cooled thoroughly, um, and it's cooling off rather quickly. And then what I like to do is just lay it out and let it air dry for a bit and get as much water off of it as possible before I pack it into the freezer bags. I mark the freezer bags with what it is and the month that I've packed it away. I tend to try to use things in the freezer that are older first before using the more recently frozen food items. And with broccoli and other vegetables and things like that, I'll keep them in the freezer for six to eight, sometimes 10 months. Okay, this is cooled off, so I'm just gonna lay the florets out like this. The reason I like to let them sort of drip dry before I pack them in freezer bags, because the drier the pieces are, um, they seem to, uh, resist freezer burn more, so that's the only reason. Then what I'll do is I'll pack them in these freezer bags and pop them in the freezer. The other thing blanching does is makes the vegetables very limber, so you can pack more into a freezer bag. And I tend to pack enough in a freezer bag that I might use for a serving for two people. I try to push all the air out of the freezer bag and seal it off like that, and now it's ready to go into the freezer. 
Earlier this summer, I had a talk with my friend Buddy Valines about a community garden project. Believe me, it's very inspiring. You see, these gardens provide a location for people to grow their own food, who otherwise might not have the space or be able to do so. You know, Buddy, I love coming out here this time of year. There's so much activity and such a great sense of community <laughs> here. It really is. It's amazing. This, this park has really been discovered. We haven't pushed it, but with the garden plots that have been here for so long, uh, more and more people as we've built the road into the interior and uh, built trails. People come out here as families and these garden plots have been here probably 30 years more, 40 maybe. But very small, but now we've got 605 plots, 450 are rented. Really? It's expanded that much? It's expanded that much. Oh, and that's very heartening. It, uh, and you've got people who've been doing it for 30 years out here and it's $50 a year. Wow, and that's, that's a bargain. You can oh, think about the number of uh, the the pounds of vegetables oh, you could grow. <laughs> now, what do you so the fifty dollars you get your plot of ground? But what else do you get? Fifty dollars that goes to pay for the water. It also goes to help pay for the superintendent that kind of overlooks the operation. Uh, we do help in some instances with tilling, and then we've got mulch. If people need mulch for the garden, we've got it. Do you have a plot? No, uh, but uh, my friends out here take care of me uh, on occasion. <laughs> I bet they do. I bet when these vegetables come in, you take home a truckload. Well, no, not that much, <laughs> but uh, we do, they've been really kind to us, uh, not only to me, but the other folks out here working, helping us make, a, make it a good place. When I visited my good friend Heidi Berry, she just knocked me over with this exceptional summer tablescape that she created, and I want to share it with you. Just take a look at this beautiful summer tablescape Heidi's created. It's out here in this living space behind the house, and I love the dark colors that she's used. They echo some of the architecture on the home. There are pergolas that extend that create outdoor rooms. They're painted dark brown, and it's also echoed in the large stone that spills water into the pool. And then on this end, there's a separate pergola, almost its own dining room here with this dining table and chairs. In the center, there's an agave, one called octopus agave, and it's surrounded with cyprivivums and sedums. Nothing could be easier to grow, but what a beautiful centerpiece. And then to echo this summer theme, there are individual vases of black-eyed Susans down the center of the table. A very casual, natural feel comes through in the placemats and also the decorative spheres or orbs that are on the table made of natural materials. I really love the way she's used the mixed colors, but all kind of in the same earth tones of the dishes, the bowls, the plates, and so forth. And then for the drinking glasses, some old-fashioned mason jars filled with a very cool beverage. It's a beautiful display and I can't wait to enjoy it. If you haven't taken the time to visit a local farm, you might do it. It would be a lot of fun. This duck house is a wonderful example of using and reusing materials. For instance, all the materials for construction here are repurposed. And the bedding used here for these little ducks, well, it's cleaned out regularly. Their manure is mixed with it. It decomposes and this becomes great mulch and compost for the gardens and pastures here on this farm. This is all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed as much as I have. Until next time, good eating and good health.